Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 21st, 2022. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast for our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss the revenue and PFD strategy some appear to be contemplating for this upcoming legislative session. Second, we discuss the recent focus on the status of the Alaska economy and how that also plays into the strategy of some for this coming legislative session. And third, we discuss the options some appear to be considering for importing LNG into, not out of, Alaska. Finally, for those that may notice, due to some technical issues that arose during taping, about a quarter of the way through this week's podcast, we shift from a video to an audio feed. You shouldn't notice much difference other than you may need to turn down the volume a bit after the shift. And now, let's join Michael. So let's start off with number one, the, uh, the session, and what kind of puppeteering you see coming out of the session this year. Oh, good term, good term. Um, puppeteering is a good term. So I've started to, to hear discussions about, you know, what the, what the plan is for the session, uh, on both the Senate and the house side in terms of, in terms of budget and in terms of how they're going to raise revenue. And, and there's something that is developed. It seems to be developing that, that is of concern and I, and people need to be aware of it and people need to start thinking about, uh, thinking about it. The, 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 the developing plan seems to be to add on to the budget. We've sort of already talked about that. Uh, K through 12 being the, the prime leader, sort of the, the plow uh, uh, going through the field of turning up the dirt of we need to spend more, we need to spend more for K through 12, and then other things being added on to it as, a, as, it, as it makes its way through the session. But on the revenue side, the thing I want to focus on this morning is on the revenue side. On the revenue side, the 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 emerging plan among the coalition seems to be to focus on oil taxes and increasing oil taxes as a way of of not not really paying for the budget, but paying for the PFD. There seems to be there seems to be an, an effort, a thought uh, of tying the increase in oil taxes to directly to the PFD in, in terms of saying, look, you want a bigger PFD, then we're going to have to raise oil taxes. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a kabuki theater uh, type approach. I don't, I don't think there's a real expectation that they're going to be able to raise oil taxes significantly and thus, and thus raise the, the PFD or put the PFD at the statutory level or even at the POMB 50-50 level. That the governor's talked about. I don't think there's an expectation they're going to achieve that, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But it's a way of misdirecting. It's a way of redirecting um, uh, an effort at redirecting people's focus on the PFD away from the legislature um, and away from the top 20 percent. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, but focusing it on the oil companies and try to pitch, try to make this a pitched battle or a or a pitch it as a as a as a as a, as, a, as a competition between the PFD on the one side and oil taxes on the other. Now, the reason it's Kabuki theater and the reason that I don't think, I don't think the oil taxes are going to go anyplace is because this session is going to occur right in the middle of the buildup to Willow, uh, the Conoco's Willow project and uh, oil searches PICA project. 
and we're going to hear a lot during the session. We're already Brad's hearing breaking some up. of it. Yes, we had a little bit of a we had a little bit of an internet failure there for a second. As we said this morning, the uh, the GCI is definitely not winning any awards today. So I'm sorry, Brad. You broke up in the middle of what you were saying, and uh, and we lost a big chunk of it. So come back. Uh, so come back for just a second, and let's uh, let's start again here. You got any idea? Just where rewind. I rewind up. one point. <laughs> Rewind one point back and and let's uh, let's start. That was when the governor had, and it, there's no idea whether or not it's going to uh, actually be accomplished. Oh, okay. So so the 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 goal seems to be, or the 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 the, the preliminary plan seems to be to pitch the the PFD against oil taxes to 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 argue that you can have increased an increased PFD if we increase oil taxes, not not otherwise. And, and, and that's for a number of reasons. One, it's to protect spending. I mean, if, if, if the, you had a side battle going on between the PFD and oil taxes here at the side, what's going on with the, with the permanent fund earnings in the meantime? Well, they're spending the permanent fund earnings in the meantime. So it's to protect spending, protect using the permanent fund earnings for, uh, uh, for spending and, and increased spending. And it's also to protect the top 20%. But but here's but here's the the reason I think it's Kabuki Theater. In the middle of the session, we're going to hear a lot about uh, uh, Conoco's Willow Project and a lot about Oil Search's Pika Project, Santos's uh, Pika Project, and how they need reliability, stability, durability of the of the fiscal situation in order to develop those projects. Those projects are big in terms of not only the production they can they can bring to the game but also in terms of the jobs and in terms of the construction activity that will go on on the North Slope uh, if, those, uh, if those projects come, uh, come into being. So what we're going to have this session is this whole, this whole, I keep saying Kabuki Theater, but that's what it's going to be, this whole Kabuki Theater going on over here about, oh, yeah, we want to increase the PFD, but we have to increase all taxes to do it. And then the pushback from the resources industry and the oil company saying, well, we can't do that or else we're going to, we're going to spoil uh, uh, the Willow Project and the Pika Project, um, and in an effort, uh, an effort to 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 keep that whole issue confined out there. And ultimately, I think the expectation is ultimately it loses. Ultimately, we don't increase oil taxes, uh, and so people will use that as an excuse for not raising the PFD. In the meantime, what's gone on is the permanent fund earnings have been diverted to spending. Spending's gone up. There's not a. They're, 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 they've tried to avoid the debate about the uh, about the PFD fitting into the earnings stream as the as the statute uh, provides, and the top twenty percent has been protected. E even if oil taxes pass, even if an increase in oil taxes would pass, the governor will veto it. But even if an oil an increase in oil taxes would pass, and the governor signed it, and that was the basis upon which. Uh, uh, increased spending occurred or the increased PFD, as some will argue, who's not paying in that scenario? The top 20 percent. They're, they're, they've been able to avoid all of this. So it's so it's it's um, this, this session is is shaping up to be theater. It's shaping up to be uh, an effort to avoid uh, a focus on increased spending by having all this sideshow going on between oil taxes and the PFD, and it's an effort to divert the anger or the, or the, the frustration that people otherwise will feel about uh, the failure to, 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 to provide a PFD at the statutory level, an effort to try to divert that to the oil companies and the, and the, and the pushback that the oil companies give, uh, give to oil taxes. It's not, it's not shaping up to be a, to be a responsible legislative session. It's, it's, it's shaping up to be more a theater to try to hide what's really going to be going on in terms of spending and where the where the revenues for that spending is coming from. Now, that's not to say that there is not a um, that there is not some taxation or some things that there's not some money left on the table with the oil companies. You and I have talked about in the past. This is not a zero sum game, um, but, but they are serious about making those changes 
at all because either they know the governor's going to veto it or maybe they go through the motions to, as you said, to Kabuki Theater to make sure the governor's going to veto it. There is some money still on the table. It just is probably going to be, uh, it's probably not going to match the amount that a lot of people or the demagogues are out there screaming about from the rooftops of a billion dollars a year or something like that. It's, a, you know, maybe a few hundred million dollars, which would make a difference. But again, nobody's serious about really fixing this at this problem. Is that right? Yeah, there, Michael, there, there is some money left on the table. Even the administration admits that. Uh, uh, when you look at, at their revenue proposals uh, or the revenue sheets they put together over time, even the administration realizes that, there, that there's money left on the table. But there's one good way to kill getting that money, and that is to overreach. That is to say, well, instead of, instead of trying to fix the Hill Court problem, which is about 100 million a year, and trying to make some adjustments to the to the to the progress progressivity of uh, of of the of the of the, sli the slider on oil taxes instead of trying to fix those in a way that would still keep the oil companies competitive, still keep uh, uh, an incentives for investment in the state. Instead of doing that, what what the expectation is, or what some's expectation is, is that is that people will overreach. They'll say, oh, we're just going to wipe out all the credits, uh, wipe out all the oil and gas tax credits, uh, and we'll raise revenue that way. Well, that doesn't work. I mean, because that will kill the incentive for additional investment in the state. That will create problems for the Willow Project um, and the PICA Project. So one way, to, one way to make sure that this whole debate fails, this whole kabuki theater sidebar debate fails, is to overreach. And 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 for and for the legislature to try to you know push for taxes that are way more than are responsible it makes it easy for the oil companies to fight back that way for that for that whole theater thing to to go on it makes it easy if it somehow slips through the legislature for the governor to veto it because it's an overreach. So yes, there are there is money left on the table. There is money to be had. I wrote a column for the landmine a couple months ago about money left on the table. There is money left on the table that the administration and the legislature should go after. But the one sure way of not getting that is to overreach and to, and to try to change the statutes in a way that, uh, that uh, uh, results in, 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 in too big a grab uh, for additional revenue. that <clears throat> are you saying that the overreach by the legislature and i just want to rephrase what you're saying because i think some people lost some of the uh some of the audio there but so what intentionally overreach as a way to force him to veto it to not really solve the problem because they like a crisis at this point and th and you know three because they want to protect that top 20 percent spend they are going this is like that again the jack sparrow running forth across the ship we always go too far and we end up rolling because instead of doing it in smaller increments we're all it's always is that what we're saying here uh it, it's part of it i mean i the the I think the strategy of how to of how to do oil taxes is still in the making, but part of the way to make sure it fails, uh, which is is to some degree right. the objective here, part of the way to make sure it fails is to overreach, and and to and to and to make it to uh, make it a big target for the oil companies to push back and say, oh well, the, you're you're just wiping out our incentive to operate in Alaska if you if you go that far. I mean, a response, responsible legislators would say we need to we need to take it an, an increment uh, at a time. Uh, Brad Keithley is our guest. We're going to take a uh, we're going to take a break because I I keep losing Brad's audio. All right, uh, we're continuing now with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I apologize uh, for you folks uh, who were trying to listen on the radio here earlier with Brad's connection and everything else. Apparently, we were just saying and uh, just finding out that. People across the state right now are having a. Uh, there's apparently GCI is having a, <clears throat> a lot of issues this morning, uh, a lot of connectivity issues. So we've gone back to do it the old-fashioned way. 
which, of course, is via the telephone. Uh, Brad Keithley uh, joins us right now. Brad, let me just summate a little bit on number one, and then you can finish up your thoughts, and, and you're going to stick with us over the top of the hour, so we'll get to two, and then we can do three after the top of the hour. But uh, on number one, the bottom line is, one, the politicians really don't want to fix what's wrong because it allows them, of course, any crisis is good. They're not going to fix the oil taxation issue because they're going to have a propensity to go all in and try and eliminate all the oil and gas tax credits, which will in and of itself stifle production instead of doing it uh, small bits and pieces at a time and going up to that four or five hundred million dollar mark. And the top 20 percent still not going to pay. That's the bottom line. Am I am I summating it properly? Yep, you are. Uh, basically, it's a it's an effort uh, to get through this session to create the rep to to use the permanent fund earnings to fund current and additional spending, additional spending for K through twelve and elsewhere. Um, and but to avoid that becoming a big PFD issue, and the F, and and the way that some are thinking of avoiding the big PFD issue is to file an oil tax bill, pursue an oil tax bill. And say you want a big PFD, then you've got to then you've got to support uh, this big oil tax bill. And if the big oil tax bill doesn't pass, or if the governor vetoes it uh, in the event it does pass, then that's why you didn't get your PFD. Not that we diverted a bunch of the permanent fund earnings. This is legislators talking. Not that we diverted a bunch of earnings over to uh, support current and increased spending. You didn't get your PFD because the oil companies wouldn't let you, or the governor vetoed whatever oil tax bill uh, over tax, oil tax bill we got through it's an effort to divert attention away from the real issue which is that there's that they're still proposing to tax the PFD tax permanent fund earnings by diverting them from the from the statutory purpose of the PFD over to government spending it, it's an effort to divert attention from that and and focus your attention, some focus Alaskans' attention, you know, squirrel uh, in an effort to do a squirrel move, focus their attention uh, uh, someplace else. Which, uh, of course, uh, this leads right back to what I've been saying to many of the politicians and many of the candidates over the last uh, three months, which is I really don't think that they want to fix this issue of the PFD and everything else because it puts them in the catbird seat. Well, they don't want to fix the issue for two reasons, Michael. One, they want to use the revenues to, to fund government. And two, they just they they don't want to tax the top 20 percent. They're very comfortable taxing middle and lower income Alaska families by cutting the PFD. They've they've established that now as a president. Governor Walker established it in 20 in 2016. The legislature's followed it since they're very comfortable taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families. But they don't want to pass something that says tax, and they don't want to pass something that affects the top twenty percent. So, they're 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 creating this theater. Um, uh, the thought process is to create this theater to divert attention away from uh, from that issue. Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. This this uh, marries up into uh, uh, number two on the weekly top three which is, of course, the economy and this latest report that is out from uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage talking about uh, how our overall economic performance is among the worst in the nation and has been for several years. But you're finding some issues with some of the research here. Well, if you if you look at the numbers that that they cite, uh, it's an oil issue. It's 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 oil revenues are down. Oil production is is down from what it once used to be. Oil prices are down from what they uh, they once were. Total oil revenues are down, and that's and that's what drives Alaska GDP. Very, there's very little else that contributes to Alaska GDP: gross gross domestic product, gross state product. And so, when, when you look at these numbers, you, yes, Alaska is down, but so is Wyoming, so is Louisiana, so is so is North Dakota, and so is Oklahoma. All states that are highly resource uh, dependent on resources for uh, uh, for uh, their revenues. Another state that's down is West Virginia, also another state that's highly dependent, in their case, coal, uh, to some degree, natural gas anymore, but uh, highly resource dependent uh, for their uh, for their revenues as well. So it's not a it's not that Alaska somehow stands out because <coughs> because you know our our economy is is failing it's because our economy is so 
dependent on oil. What there, there's there's two ways in which this economic study is being set up to be used in the in the next session. One is to justify increased spending, government spending on other things. The argument will be our economy's down. The way to get our economy up is spending on education, both K through 12 and higher education, spending on on other things, improving the quality of life in Alaska, uh, which you know translates into more government spending. And so this this study is is being used as a setup for those who want to increase spending. They'll use it as a baseline to argue that uh, that we need to increase spending in other ways to to pull Alaska up from uh, from the from the depths that we're in. The other thing the study is going to going to be used for, and I don't <laughs> it, it's it's sort of an offshoot of what the of what the original purpose was, but it's going to be used by the oil companies by Conoco and and uh, and uh, uh, oil search and others to argue, look, I mean, Alaska's economy is oil. And we've got these two great projects out here. We've got Pika uh, from the oil search standpoint, and we've got Willow from the Conoco standpoint. And you want Alaska to be to, to get off the bottom, which is where the report says it, it is, then we need to invest in, in these projects. Those project these projects will come with additional jobs, with additional private sector uh, activity in terms of in terms of third party contractors helping out um, uh, 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 in, investment. Uh, on the North Slope, and so if you want to, if you want to get off, off off the bottom, then we need to maintain the oil company, the the oil industry, and that's a reason that's going to be used as a reason then to push back on oil taxes. So this study is a setup. <laughs> this this and 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 other discussions about Alaska's economic uh, situation is a setup for the coming session. A to try to justify uh, increased government spending, but B. It'll also be used by the oil companies to push back on the effort to increase oil taxes. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. The uh, the numbers in here are pretty scary, uh, but as you're saying, a lot of this goes right back to the fact that we're losing oil production and that trickle down effect from employment and subcontractors and other private sectors support industries and things like that. You're saying a lot. I mean, this is all connected, and of course, this also doesn't really mention or take into account the effect of the recession to begin with. But this is all it's all connected at this point. Yeah, it, it is, Michael, and it's and it's and and, and those who are going to say, oh, we need more government spending on K through 12 or on higher ed in order to offset offset this, this situation. There's no there's no direct link. They can't show they're not going to be able to show that if we do spend more on those activities, that that's going to lift. <coughs> excuse me, that that's going to lift Alaska off the bottom. But they're but but what they're going to say is we're on the bottom now. Here's an idea about how we might get ourselves off the bottom, additional government spending in all of these in all of these areas. And so we ought, we ought to try it. We ought to try additional government spending in all these areas. At the same time as this Kabuki theater is going on about the PFD, the PFD somehow being linked to oil taxes. So it's it's all <coughs> excuse me, it's all feeding into this next legislative cycle and setting up the argument that we need to spend more. But we can't. But we can't spend more by taking it out of the oil companies. So it's going to have to come out of the PFD. The 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 one thing not mentioned in that in that whole discussion is the top twenty percent. The top twenty percent contributing to the costs of the state as well. It's all going to be focused on either the oil companies have to pay or the PFD has to pay. There's no one else to go to. So as we look. <laughs> As we look at this, uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. As we look at this, we come to realize that really the end game here, and I mean, I, I kind of want to just from the 10,000 foot view, the end game is the complete and total subsumption of, of, of the PFD, right? I mean, that's exactly, they're going to absorb it all. And then where will we be? Because they're gonna if if this is if spend is the answer and the only source is the PFD, once that's gone, the appetite for spending is not gonna go away, right? So what happens then? Yeah, Rob Myers, Rob Myers has done has done some good good thought on this. And basically it's then we go to taxes. Now it's gonna take them a while to run through the PFD. It's gonna take them, I mean, it took us a decade to run through all of our savings. They're they're gonna they're gonna keep a little bit of the PFD each year 
to sort of say, well, we tried, you know, we really fought hard for middle and lower income Alaska families. And this is, this is, you know, we, we, we saved this much of the PFD. And so it's going to take a while to run through all that. But at the end of it, we end up with taxes. Um, and, and, and then, you know, we finally get to the point where the top 20% are paying, are contributing to the cost of government and they start pushing back on, on, on spending levels, but we're at much higher spending levels uh, at that point. And the PFD, the middle and lower, the taxes on middle and lower income Alaska families has been complete and, they've, and we've diverted all of it to government. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. About a minute here, Brad, you want to uh, you want to wind up on number two? Well, number two and number one are the same. Yes, Alaska has economic issues, but those economic issues are tied to oil. Pika and Willow give us an opportunity to sort of work our way up from from the from the the economic issues that uh, that we've got right now, um, and and we need to and we need to prioritize those. Those are good projects. There are going to be a lot of jobs. There's going to be a lot of activity. We need we need to to focus on those and and encourage those. But what others what what others are going to do is they're going to use these studies as a justification for in- increasing K through 12 spending, increasing. Uh, higher ed spending, increasing spending in a number of areas, saying that that's going to rise the Ala- uh, 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 cause the Alaska economy to rise. But think about it for a moment. That argument is government is the solution. More yeah. government, yep. more government spending is the which, solution. Which is what we've been fighting about here for years on this program. It's the narrative. Only through the direct benevolent intervention of government can we succeed. This is the whole problem in a nutshell, Brad. People who only think that society can move forward with direct benevolent intervention of government, i.e. spending, is what it's all about. And quite honestly, in looking back at what's gone on in this election, Brad, uh, I don't know if you heard the show last week after you got off the air with me, but... Um, I started asking the question of, you know, what are we doing wrong? What are those of us that are smaller government conservatives, what are we doing wrong? And maybe, just maybe, we need to change our tune. Maybe we need to just go on and we should just turn 180 degrees instead of just saying cuts, cuts, cuts. Maybe we should just advocate for a tax now. Just advocate for a tax now to get it done. And, of course, that raised a lot of ire in the chat room but some people some people were like okay let's do that let's try anything and of course there was an article from um uh alexander uh at the university of alaska icer he has got a several uh uh, james alexander he's got several different parts talking about how because we're not being taxed government is the growth of government is out of control and it's all tied it's tied to nothing because we have no control over it because we're not paying for it. It makes some interesting arguments, and I, I don't know if you've read any of his things, but it, he definitely makes some interesting arguments. It's the whole idea of not taxation without representation, but representation without taxation. Yeah, Michael, I, I, I have read his stuff. Here's, here's the deal. Here's what people miss. We are being taxed. Yeah. PFD, cut, PFD cuts are a tax. They're a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. What's missing here? is an equitable tax, a tax that reaches all Alaska families and creates an incentive in all Alaska families to push back on spending. You're, we're not going to win if it's just middle and lower income Alaska families that are feeling the hit and that are pushing back on spending. If the top 20% can be agnostic or, or, or just ignore the fact that spending is going on because they're not having to pay for it, we're never, we're never going to win on pushing back. So the problem isn't as much that we aren't being taxed. We are being taxed. The problem is the tax isn't broad-based and isn't affecting all Alaska families in the same way. Well, I would agree with that. So my question was, and it goes back to my question of what do we do differently, Brad? Because we fought this battle. You and I have been fighting this battle for going on seven years now. Uh, I've been fighting it in in a similar vein for going on 20 years. And we don't seem to be making really any headway. I mean, we've changed out the players. We've changed out nearly half the legislature. And yet we keep putting the same kind of yahoos back in there who are basically looking to government to solve everything. And so the question becomes, we could stand in the middle of the road with our hand out saying, halt, no more spending. And then the bus just runs us over. I mean, it's just all that it, all that it does. So maybe the answer is to... Flip 180 degrees and just start saying, you know what we need? We need a we need a fair and equitable tax for everybody. That's what we're advocating, and that will that will reduce government spending. Maybe. Yeah. To I mean, me, I don't know. to me, 
Well, to me, uh, the argument I've been making since 2017 now is we shouldn't be spending more. We shouldn't have to tax. But if we're going to tax, then everybody, all Alaska families ought to have skin in the game. All Alaska families ought to be responsible equitably for the tax. And by engaging the top 20 percent, by making them feel the same pain, the same economic effect that middle and lower income Alaska families are having to feel through PFD cuts, by engaging the top 20 percent, and getting them to push back on spending, uh, then I then I think we have a chance of, of bringing spending under control. But as long as the top twenty percent don't have to pay, as long as they can sit off in the sidelines and 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 use their political capital to make sure that if there are, is payment, it's the middle and lower income Alaska families that have to do it through PFD cuts. As long as the top twenty percent can can set off to the side, then then we're not going to get spending under control. So it's it's a two step. One, we shouldn't be spending more. But if we're going to be spending more, the cost of it ought to be spread equi- equi- equitably across all Alaska families. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they definitely raised some ire in the chat room. Any discussion on um, on uh, uh, additional taxes has raised some ire. But at this point, Brad, I just don't know what to do. I'm throwing anything against the wall uh, just to try and think of how do we move the needle? How do we move the needle back to where, you know, to where everybody is equitable, you know, everybody is equal in this in this game of chance? You're right. I mean, we're we're being taxed. Uh, Harold is right. We're we're already some of the heaviest tax people in the nation. We just don't see it. And because we don't see it, we don't feel it. We're disconnected from it. And everybody's like, no, that's just must be the way it is. And I just don't know how to put people um I just don't know how to put, you know, put people first in this regard. I just don't know how yeah. to get them engaged in that. Well, I think, I think, Michael, one way that I've tried to do over time is instead of referring to it as PFD cuts, we talk about it as a PFD tax. I mean, one, one of the one of the reasons one one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of engagement that people push back and say we aren't being taxed and we don't want to be taxed is they don't realize the tax that we're paying in terms of PFD cuts. So I think we ought to be I think we ought to be upfront and talk about the PFD PFD cuts as a tax, the PFD tax. And then the question is, we are being taxed, middle and lower income Alaska families are being taxed much more heavily than upper than than the top 20%. If we're going to be taxed and we are being taxed, then that that burden ought to be spread equitably and it ought to be spread in a way that gets non-residents as well. I mean, one of the things about PFD cuts is we only take money from Alaskans. We leave seven to ten percent of of government costs on the ta- that that could be paid by non residents. We leave that we leave that on the table. We don't we don't try to go get that uh, uh, by relying on PFD cuts. So we ought we we ought to recognize we're being taxed that we are paying a tax a PFD tax. Uh, and and the question is how do we spread that more equitably to include the top twenty percent and to include non residents. So we've talked about the session, the economy, which are actually those two things and the and two discussions are kind of joined at the hip. Uh, but now let's talk about the future with AKLNG and what does it mean for Alaska? Brad, what are you talking about here? What is, uh, you know, the importing, we're hearing now about the importing of LNG into South Central because we can't be bothered to make our own, yada, yada, yada. Give us the rundown here. Hertz had an article. Um, Rhett Nat Hertz is writing a blog uh, now, and it's been picked up both in a, in the uh, ADN and then the Alaska Beacon. The headlines in the ADN is: Could oil-rich Alaska be forced to import natural gas? Two utilities are looking into it, and this is an outgrowth of a statement that Hillcorp, uh, which is the major uh, dominant gas supplier, gas producer in the Cook Inlet. Uh, made several months ago about uh, about not being comfortable uh, entering into new long-term contracts when the existing long-term contracts uh, run out uh, for natural gas supplies, both to NSTAR, uh, which is the the natural gas uh, utility that serves homes and uh, arm in the military bases and, and and other areas that use natural gas for for largely for heating. Uh, the contract that Hillcorp has with NSTAR and with Chugach, uh, the main electric supplier to the uh, to the Anchorage Basin um, and to others uh, along uh, along the uh, other electric suppliers along the uh, uh, along the, the road system. 
Um, and and Hillcorp made the statement that they're concerned that that they that they're not comfortable entering into new long term contracts when the existing contracts expire because uh, they are are not producing uh, uh, as much natural gas, not finding as much natural gas as they uh, as they want. Uh, that's led to uh, the governor uh, uh, starting to emphasize renewables. Uh, and the electric utility starting to ex uh, emphasize renewables as a source of power uh, for the electric grid. Um, and NSTAR uh, uh, now per looking at uh, importing LNG as a, as a supply of natural gas, importing LNG into the Cook Inlet as a supply of, uh, as a supply of natural gas uh, uh, to, to it to serve its customers. And Shugatch is part of that as well. It's also looking at uh, importing LNG into uh, into the Cook Inlet in the event uh, in, in the event uh, natural gas supplies aren't sufficient and renewables don't come on at a pace uh, necessary to supply uh, to, to supply the electric grid. We've been through this before. <laughs> we went through this in 2011, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. Indeed, some may recall that then Mayor Dan Sullivan convened a blue ribbon panel to look into the potential loss or the potential decline of natural gas supplies uh, in the Cook Inlet. And several things happened around that time to solve the problem. One, Hillcorp replaced uh, Marathon and Unical um, and ultimately ConocoPhillips as, as, as a gas supplier in the Cook Inlet because Hillcorp has a lower uh, uh, operating cost. It was able to justify drilling more than those companies had. And so some additional supply came on as a result of that. And secondly, the legislature passed a series of incentives that essentially uh, 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 subsidized uh, producers for uh, developing uh, additional supplies, mostly captured by Hillcorp because they'd bought out Mar Marathon and, and Uni Unical and Conoco, the other suppliers, um, uh, a series of incentives uh, to develop additional supplies. Some think, <laughs> some think that this is merely that Hillcorp's statement is merely a ploy to try to get those credits back, to try to get that, those subsidies uh, back from the legislature uh, to encourage uh, and develop additional gas supplies. That uh, that they're playing a, a long uh, a long game of talking about shortages as a as a means of leveraging the legislature back into recreating those incentives that existed. Uh, that were passed in the in the in, in 2010, 2011, 20, uh, 2012. Others believe that Hillcorp's being honest and that there isn't additional supply, um, and that uh, and that we are facing a, a potential shortage in the uh, in the Cook Inlet. In either event, uh, there's a lot of activity now uh, of of looking into uh, bringing LNG uh, into uh, into the Cook Inlet. We have the existing LNG plant that Tesoro bought, well, Mar now Tesoro, then Tesoro, now Marathon, uh, bought the old ConocoPhillips export plant that, uh, that at some cost could be converted into an import plant, um, a regasification plant, or a, a, a reliquifac regasification plant. Um, and, uh, and there's some, uh, uh, some kit existing in the, in, the, in the Cook Inlet to be able to, uh, to do that. Um, it, it's an issue that, with, that, that certainly needs a lot of attention. Uh, hopefully, the legislature does, doesn't run off the edge and say, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm a little concerned about this because Kathy Giesel was one of those who led the effort to develop the, uh, the, 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 the subsidies uh, back in the 2011 and 2012 timeframe, and, and it looks like Giesel may be coming back to the legislature. But hopefully the legislature doesn't run off the deep end and say, oh, my gosh, we need to reestablish all these subsidies uh, to encourage uh, additional development. Hopefully we, we are, are thoughtful about how we uh, how about how we approach this problem. LNG would uh, importing LNG into the lower into in the Cook Inlet would be a would be a shock. I mean, the LNG market isn't what it used to be. It's a lot higher priced as a result of all the activities that have gone on in Europe, the shutdown of the Russian supply into Europe. The, the the conversion of Europe now to, to looking to uh, to LNG supplies in the world as a source of, as a source of gas uh, coming into uh, coming into Europe uh, LNG prices are a lot higher than they used to be there are a lot Asian Asian LNG prices which is what Alaska LNG would look like are a lot higher than the, than the existing uh, prices um, 
but it's it's a it's an issue that that needs to be addressed, needs to be thought about, needs to be uh, 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 confronted and 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 analyzed. Um, my hope is simply that we just don't run off the deep, that the legislature doesn't run off the deep end uh, uh, in the process and and recreate all these subsidies that uh, were such a were such a burden uh, the last time we we spent. The state, in in terms of subsidies, spent about two billion dollars uh, uh, to uh, to help subsidize the Cook Inlet uh, gas industry, and I'm not sure we need to. I'm not sure we need to go down that road again yet. So, I mean, your personal opinion on whether or not the reporting from Hill Corp is just posturing or is true? I mean, do you see it? Uh, do you see it being possible either way, or do you have a definite? Uh, do you have a definite belief in what they're saying right now with the with the the lack of of gas so far? When we when we hit this issue back in 2011 and 2012, there were several studies that the Department of Natural Resources did that suggested there was a, there was additional gas supplies in the Cook Inlet. We just hadn't found them yet, um, and and part of the reason for the subsidies was to encourage going out and developing these additional the, the, exploring for and finding these additional gas supplies. We never really did that. What we did was just sort of scrape the rocks harder uh, in the existing fields that we had, uh, and we never found these additional. We never, we never really made the effort to find these additional supplies. So I'm not. I, I, we we've never really fully resolved the 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 analysis that was done back in 2011 and 2012 about whether there is additional supplies out there. Some people argue, well, you know, Biden has shut down federal waters, and so we're never going to find these supplies. The Cook Inlet doesn't start federal waters until way the heck out there. Um, and so I don't that's not that's not what the issue is. The issue is whether the Cook Inlet Basin, the state waters, the Cook Inlet state waters have been fully explored. Um, and and the conclusion in 2011, 2012 was that they hadn't been. So we created these subsidies to go do it, but that's never really, that was not really how they were used. Um, so I, I, I'm, a, I'm a skeptic when somebody says, well, we're out of gas, we're not going to develop anymore. Um, good luck, you're on your own, we're not going to renew contracts. I'm a skeptic about whether that is just a ploy to uh, try to restart these subsidies again, uh, or, uh, or it's the truth. I, I, uh, I <clears throat> I, I don't know which it is, uh, and uh, and I think we need need to do some additional work to figure out which it is. Isn't isn't there an argument here that if we truly are having a you know if we truly are facing an LNG shortage that I mean we've got you know one point seven trillion cubic feet of gas on our slope shouldn't we be looking for ways to either you know bring it around the horn from ourselves or get a gas line or doesn't this open the door for that at least or is it just it, 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 it does, Michael, and and there's certainly certainly that effort. But the the honest truth is, uh, unless we get export contracts, unless we have a deal for export export contracts, the volume ex, uh, big volume export contracts from Alaska North Slope, just building down from the North Slope down to supply just Fairbanks and and and, and Anchorage um, is so costly. I mean, the amount of kit per unit. Uh, that the fat cost is so costly that frankly it's cheaper to import LNG. So yes, that certainly. I mean, wh what it does is is solidify that there is an in-state market for gas, but the in-state market itself is not enough to justify the expense. It'd be cheaper to go to. It'd be cheaper even at today's prices. It'd be cheaper cheaper to go to imported LNG. So. It, it puts a it puts a, a an emphasis on finding those export markets, and and in in hoping to to you know develop those export markets. But that's what's got to happen to make the to make the North Slope projects work. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, I guess final thoughts on this. Um, I mean, what what do you think is going to happen? Is it with with the fact that maybe Kathy Geisel gets back? Do you see this uh, working in their regard, or I mean, what what do you say? I, I see some beginning to to, to make the uh, try the effort to develop these subsidies again. Um, I see uh, I, I see you know I see continued focus on renewables and developing renewables as a way of getting uh, the power plants, the the electric providers off the off of natural gas or reduce their uh, their dependence on natural gas. 
I see some continued analysis of LNG filing filing for per permits doesn't cost that much to file for the permits to to uh, to to try to develop the ability to import LNG. Uh, I even see studies about you know how how would we convert the uh, the now marathon uh, LNG plant into an import plant. Um, I see you know all of those continuing to go down continuing to go down the road. But at the same time. I ho I'm hopeful that DNR gets digs back into the data that it had in 2011 and 2012 and figures out whether there's additional, there are in fact additional supplies in the Cook Inlet. It's just the lack of drilling uh, that, that has caused them not to be developed. And then think about ways about, short of the subsidies, the level of subsidies we did last time, think about ways to, uh, to encourage the development of those supplies. Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find him at ak4sb.com. Also on Facebook, Brad, final thoughts here. Well, Michael, it's, uh, <clears throat> we're heading into a long legislative session. Uh, I think there's going to be a lot of kabuki theater uh, involved in that session uh, uh, from the standpoint of trying to divert attention away from the fact that, that more of the permanent fund earnings are going to be diverted into government. Um, I, and and there's going to be an increased emphasis on spending, possibly uh, increasing Cook Inlet uh, subsidies as a way of, uh, of 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 increasing as a as a form of increasing spending there as well. So it's going to be a long legislative session, but people need to be thinking through. There's going to be a lot of theater involved in this session, and and they need to separate the theater from the reality uh, of what's uh, of what's going on. And Brad Keithley is our guest here on the Michael Duke Show. Uh, final, just final question here, Brad. So two things. First of all, um, what about exporting gas uh, and and tanking it from the North Slope down to the Cook Inlet versus building a multi-billion dollar, you know, uh, feeder pipeline? What, in, what about instead of, you know, a Tidewater to Tidewater uh, doing that? Is that even on the discussion board or is that too technically difficult? It has been in the past, Michael. There's two issues with it. One has been sea ice, um, and 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 that's <clears throat> that may be less of a problem than the last time uh, uh, I saw it uh, heavily su uh, studied. But the other problem is the 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 ocean up there is very is fairly shallow, um, and the the problems uh, associated with uh, either uh, uh, trying to figure out how you can get shallow enough boats. No one's ever been able to do that, or dredging the issues that would be created by dredging your way out of uh, of the of that of those shallow waters has always been a big issue. I, it's not that the it's not that the companies haven't looked at it; they have. I mean, they, they want to they want the lowest cost option. If there's a if there would be a way of shipping out of there, um, uh, that would be a that would be a great thing to do. Uh, there's also been some discussion in the past. Now that we're making Nome into a deep water port or into a port. There's also been some discussion in the past, instead of building the line down to the Cook Inlet, uh, to build the line over to Nome and, and to LNG, the gas out of Nome, um, or to some Port Wainwright or, or somewhere uh, along the, the Western shore. Um, there's a lot of issues with that. You'd have to go through, you have to build a pipeline through ANWR, um, or not through ANWR, I'm sorry, through NPRA, um, and, uh, and some other issues involved in that, plus, you wouldn't have direct supply into Fairbanks, which has always been an issue. Plus, you wouldn't have a direct supply into the Cook Inlet. You'd have to bring it around in LNG, and and the economics of that aren't easy. So it's um, I am sure that there are people studying that again, uh, uh, but there have been issues more than just sea ice, more more than just the ice issues. There have been issues with that uh, in the past, and and I'm not sure anybody's figured out how to resolve them yet. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. Always interesting to discuss things with you, and uh, I appreciate you coming and, and uh, talking with us. Michael, as always, uh, thanks for having me on. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.